Hello everyone, and welcome to the Sunday Special. My name is James Fisher, and this is going to be a very different kind of podcast today, as I'm just going to be talking to you guys today. It is uh, episode 17 of our Sunday Special series, and I'm calling this one My JRPG Story. I've kind of told bits and pieces of this over the years, um, but I kind of want to, I've been doing some recollecting and going back in the the memory banks, and I think I've got a pretty decent idea, and what I want to kind of do is just show how certain games and this genre has been so influential in my life, carried me through both good times and bad, and maybe by hearing my story, it'll get you thinking about your story, and if it wasn't, you know, these games or even JRPGs, just how games have allowed us to deal with some pretty heavy stuff in our lives, and I've not even had, <laughs> I would call it traumatic uh, life at all, but, um, so that's kind of where I want to go with today's special. I hope you enjoy it. Um, I'm actually recording this video as well, and I've assembled <laughs> a crew of, um, I don't have them all, but, um, as I highlight certain time periods, I'm going to be showing you some of the games in my collection as well. Hopefully that'll put a, a smile on your, on your face. So like any good story, it has to begin at the beginning. Um, I am 39 years old and have been playing video games, honestly, as long as I remember, either by, I don't know, necessity or by choice. It's just one of those things that has always brought me comfort and joy. And um, the earliest memories that I have, um, as far as really getting into games, I would say it was probably when I was around seven-ish. Maybe six or seven, something in that time frame. Um, we had moved a couple times already, and uh, in this new neighborhood, trying to make friends. And one of the uh, the earliest people that I connected with had an Atari Twenty Six Hundred. So we're really showing exactly how far back we're going here. And one of the games that he had, I guess that connected with me more than others, and there was tons of them that I remember later playing, but one that sticks out in my mind was called Adventure. And if you don't recall what that was, uh, it's, it's pretty simplistic to describe. You were a dot, and uh, you were to go on an adventure. And uh, from what I remember, you're basically going around trying to find keys to castles, there's dragons that look like seahorses because that's the best that it could really <laughs> generate at the time. And I guess I just remembered that it felt like there was something more going on, especially at that time. Games were just games. On the surface, you played them. It was usually a competition of some sorts. If you had a two-player game, it was trying to defeat the other player. Um, there were a handful of other types of games that you were you know, battling enemies, but it kind of felt like you were going on the quest and there was, you know, something deeper. Like why was, you know, there dragons? Why did you need the keys to this castle? What, I just felt like there was something more going on. And I think that's what kind of drew me to RPGs and then uh, more or so, especially at the time, JRPGs. As I had a desire to want something a little more out of my game rather than just I beat the level, I beat the game, I got a new high score, I, um, I'm i the best at this game as compared to everybody else, putting your initials at the end on the leaderboard. That didn't really resonate and with me. How I still loved playing, you know, uh, going to Nintendo with the Super Mario Brothers and Legend of Zelda and all those um, great, great games. I love them. But as I started to get a bit older, and let me go ahead and say this, everything that I recall seems to be a couple years later, or at least a year or two later than, let's say, a game released or gone public. And I think that's 
a part of just my upbringing in general, but also where I lived at was for lack of a better term, a bit backwards. It still is a bit backwards and we're okay with that. But as opposed to your major big cities getting everything when it came out, especially games in our genre, um, it was a while till they got down, you know, to our level and, um, and that's okay. But as I've looked over the years, oh, this game came out in 1991. Well, I don't think I played it in 1991. If I was lucky, I played it in 92, maybe even 93. Just as an example, as some of these things are obviously a bit fuzzy. It's been a while. Um, but getting into JRPGs, um, a long time ago, for those of you who remember... Um, there used to be places that you could rent movies and video games. And by and large, that is how we played most of our games. Uh, growing up, we didn't have a whole lot of money. Um, Mom and Dad worked very hard, but with uh, two kids and limited incomes, there was just there was only so much. But one of the things that they loved to do was go and rent a movie usually on the weekend and to keep the kids pacified <laughs> on the weekend while they um, were out of school we were allowed to rent a game most of the time games you could rent for two nights which was perfect for a weekend you know you couldn't be having it on a school night um, but it was a reward for friday and saturday night and I, we had a shop a few miles down the road we knew the owner he was really cool and um he made a point, actually, you know, the movies were kind of back in the store, but the games were right there as soon as you came in. And I just remember, you know, I had no trouble spending the entire amount of time that mom was looking for a movie or talking, you know, with people that she knew or the owner. I would just gaze at all of these Nintendo games. And if you remember back in the day, Nintendo covers were just so unique. They had these personalities that really spoke to, well, some of them, some of them had absolutely nothing to do with the game that was inside of it. But, you know, if you're sometimes in the store, they were behind the glass case. You couldn't get to them. Whereas at a rental store, the cases were empty. You could sit there and look at the cover. You could read the back. You could really get a gist of what the game was about. And, but ultimately it came down to when you got home and played it. Now, Having a little brother, most of the times we had to rent a two-player game um, and we had to share. But as I got a little bit older and I started to be able to read, so you're probably talking, you know, 88, something around that time range, I was drawn to and I had to play this game. I mean, look at it. You're, you're a giant knight. You're facing off against... Just this terrible looking dragon with those teeth. Just you, your sword, and your shield. I wanted to play that game. And so mom finally got it for me. And I struggled with it. Um, I didn't understand, you know, back then you had to press the button, you know, it was in the menu to open doors. You had to use the menu to go downstairs. You didn't. I had no clue what this game was. You just get dropped into this world. And what ends up happening is you get lost in that world. You forget about <laughs> the the day you forget about your you know, your brother screaming in the next room or whatever troubles you're going with at school and um maybe it's you know the middle of winter and it's snow outside. It doesn't matter. Or it's hot outside, you don't really want to go out. You could get lost in this world. And that's exactly what I did with Dragon Warrior. Um, it was tough. I didn't understand. But I think what really drew me in. I was. I don't want to brag. But I was a little bit of an above average student. Later. Uh, I believe uh, Dawn has made a joke about this a time or two before. You know. We were in the, the gifted category. Right. And it turned out oh so well. Um, but I was early to learn how to read, but I really feel like, uh, playing Dragon Warrior and subsequent games made me a better reader, 
a better comprehender and kind of pushed me. Um, it wasn't reading in a school, you know, textbook. This was something that I was choosing to do. It was challenging me and I really enjoyed it. Now, Dragonware utterly kicked my butt. Um, it's only been, uh, later with the, uh, the mobile release that I've went back and played and was able to do that. No problem. But I did kind of understand the basics of it. The, the need to grind, the need to level up, to get better equipment, to figure out what's going on in the story. And of course, Dragon Warrior, you're just you. It's, uh, <laughs> you don't have a party to fall back on. But uh, the thing I, I will never forget is A, going down into a cave the first time and quickly realizing that you needed a torch. Um, money was so hard to come by in that game. So you'd only get like one torch, maybe two. You'd get about halfway through the cave, which were just you know, confusing as could be, no matter what your torch goes out, you have the limited little area to see, and you're, you're going to die. You're not going to make it out of your life. Or if you're lucky enough to get to the other side of the cave, you're dropped off in the middle of nowhere with next to nothing HP, and you're going to die there instead. And hopefully you saved before you left at the church. Dragon Warrior, started but I didn't get very far in it. I would dare say I was lucky if I got a couple hours into the game before I was not able to progress any further and got frustrated and honestly it probably turned me off of JRPGs for a little while. It was a few months later that I decided to get back into it and luckily there was this game. And Dragon Warrior started it, and I have that fond affinity for all Dragon Quest titles. But, see, like, you know, right here on the back, 1985. I wasn't playing in 85, that's for sure. That Final Fantasy hooked me. The party system, you got to create all four characters. Which is funny because now I actually don't like doing that as much. Back then it was everything. So, you know, you would make you the, the lead fighter. And you'd have four or three of your friends with you to go off on this epic adventure. Now, of course, Final Fantasy, you could only have four characters. Uh, four letters in your character's name. So, I couldn't even be James. I was always J, J-A-Y. And then, you know whatever friends I could find that only had four letters in their name. There wasn't many, so I had to make up a few. Um, but I just dove into that game, and I think it was probably the first one that later on I would actually ask and was given. Um, you got video games on your birthday, and you got video games at Christmas time. It wasn't something that we got throughout the year. We didn't have the money. We would rent them. But I would definitely remember asking for that game later on and uh, getting it as my first JRPG that I could own. I don't, I'll be honest, I don't know if that is my original copy or not. I don't have the box. And that is one thing I'm sad to say is I don't have any of the boxes for any of the Nintendo or Super Nintendo titles. You didn't need them. They were just taking up space. And we would collect them into... They had these like video game organizers back then that was basically a, a box and had little shelves that would pull out and they would fit inside there. Or for the Nintendo, we had this... It was basically a tray that the system would sit down in and with little slots. And you could probably fit like 20 or 30 games in there around your system and that's what we did as we later accumulated them um over the years but no i mean final fantasy just did it 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 hit all these things that a young james was looking for and could excel at by that point maybe because of my knowledge of dragon war i was able to really understand what was going on in Final Fantasy. My reading had gotten a little better by that point. I was able to comprehend a little bit more. And I can remember actually getting uh, towards the end 
and making it to the final dungeon. I never could beat Chaos, though. Um, I think I could get through the four fiends that you had to refight before that, but um, <laughs> I could never, never beat that game. It was not till many, many years later that I uh, was finally able to accomplish that. Um, I believe on the re-release for the PlayStation, I finally, um, finally went back and and did that. But that was really the spark. But then it was a while because I don't recall many other JRPGs that I played on that system. Um, I never saw Dragon Warrior 2 and 3. I never saw those games growing up. It just wasn't wasn't a thing that was there for me to even see or rent. I probably would have and would have loved it. Um, I remember some other you know adventure type games like Chrysalis and, and those type things, but I don't ever recall playing any more JRPGs on my Nintendo until many years after that. And this goes on to helping me deal with certain things in my real life that was going on. I believe I was eight, eight or nine, somewhere in that range. And like many people who had to deal with this, my parents got divorced. And I remember being okay with it because even at that age, I could tell that, you know, mommy and daddy weren't, they weren't really happy. And they were certainly, I think they'd stuck it out as long as they could for the sake of us, but just couldn't keep lying to themselves any longer. And I think that's important. I I learned a lot of important lessons because of that divorce, good and bad, but we're people and that's the way it is. Um, But... I think it was every other weekend then we would go and spend with dad and it was different and it was kind of hard. And I think my dad had a hard time kind of connecting with us because the divorce hadn't been pretty. Um, I don't remember a whole lot about it, but I know there was the act itself was an obvious divide, but I think like the legal part of it. And then, you know, now he's got to pay child support. So he's struggling to make his ends meet on top of now supporting us and had to work harder than ever, you know, and like, I know he loved us, but it was still as a strain and he couldn't work when he got to watch us, you know, so he had to make sure he was off. And it just, it was tough. I know it was tough on him and it was tough on us, but one of the things that helped me through it was he carried on that <laughs> tradition of, of renting a game. And, you know, I think he had the main TV that they would watch sports on. Uh, my dad was a sports fanatic and I do get some of that from him, but there was a TV back in the bedroom that we could have got the Nintendo to. So we'd always bring it with us and we went to a different game store um there was probably like three shops in our town not counting blockbuster which moved in um shortly thereafter but local game shop or uh rental stores and i'd always request to go down to the one that was probably the farthest away and because they had this This game. If you've heard me talk about JRPGs in my life and ones that are some of my favorites of the day, that is my favorite Dragon Quest game. Um, I cannot tell you how many times we rented that game. (laughs) It wasn't until many years later that I bought that just to have as my own personal collection. It it really meant a lot to me. Um, But... (sighs) I just rent it and of course when you rented it like somebody could have easily rented it after you and erased your profile and so many times I had to start over but then a few times I was able to continue and able to finally you know beat this game the thing that I remember the most was and I (laughs) I'm not sure why they did it but when you rented a game it would usually come in a plastic case with the game and the instruction manual 
that Dragon Warrior 4 had obviously the instruction book, but it had um, two maps that came with it that I can remember. Or maybe it was a double-sided map. It had the world map on it. So you could just, like, oh my goodness. Like, as a as a young child, be able to see this world. And like, oh, I'm going here and I'm going there. Oh, yeah, that's where that um, dungeon was. But on the back, it had a list of all the armors and weapons. And so, with Dragon uh, Quest titles, they go in a certain order and they always have that there's a level of progression. So you you could kind of say, okay, well, I started off with, you know, the wooden equipment and I'm going to go up to iron next and then, you know, the steel, that there's that th- series of progressions. So you could kind of check out what you had and then be like, oh, well, this should be next. This should be next. Oh, what is this one? Where can I find it? This is what I need to go. I would... When I couldn't play, <laughs> I would just go and lay on the bed and stare at these maps. And so not only the game did I get lost in, but also the experience of the game. And I, I thought that was truly magical. And it really helped me deal with what was going on in my world around me. That, yeah, maybe we were all hurting and we knew it, but... I didn't have to hurt while I was playing this. I could just forget about it for a while and we could all just do our own thing. And that's, and that's okay. But that <laughs> Dragon Warrior 4 was just so good. And I loved the chapter system of the first four chapters with the different characters that you were then going to meet the hero with and journey with this huge journey in chapter five. I wish there were more games like that. I really resonated with that one. The DS remake of it is phenomenal. Um, if you've got that, you should definitely pick it up. Highly, highly recommend it. But that started this um, this trend of games being a part of my life, and in particular JRPGs being a part of my life, and it has to this day. Let's take a quick break and... We're going to get into the Super Nintendo games after we have a word from our sponsor. All right, everybody, welcome back. We are counting down the years and going through some of my favorite memories and showing some of the games in my collection. We just got done with the the Nintendo years. So I think what we're going to do is go through the Super Nintendo and that era, and we'll probably... We'll probably cut it right there, as I feel like that could be a pretty good stop point. We'll make this kind of a two-part series, and maybe we'll follow up on it at a later point in time. I hope you've been enjoying it. If you have, don't forget, go down there and give the uh, like and subscribe, as this is going to be on YouTube. And um, don't forget, if you haven't already, you can follow us on Facebook for everyday uh, stories. Usually, I also do a story every day with a video on YouTube, so you'll want to subscribe for that. But we're on Twitter as well, all those fun places. We are doing listener support, so that would be awesome if you want to click down at the very bottom of this podcast description, there'll be a link for listener support, as well as Patreon. So I'm on there, I'm not quite sure how that all works quite yet, but I'm sure if you search for JRPG Report, you can find out and support us over there as well. Um... One of the things that had carried forward um, in my life and and gaming with JRPGs is small amounts of funds and the renting. So even as the Nintendo went out, Super Nintendo was in, we were certainly not one of the ones that picked it up first thing. We couldn't. It just wasn't wasn't a possibility and I think it was around it was one of my birthdays and I had a couple friends over and my mom had you could actually rent systems back in the day and our local shop allowed us to rent a Super Nintendo for a couple days 
And as part of my birthday party, I had a sleepover with some of my friends. We stayed up, and that was the very first time I can ever remember doing this, staying up all night long, because I had to wait. We rented three games. I don't remember what the other two were. Probably like Mario Kart was probably one of them, and another, maybe Mario World or whatever. We stayed up playing those. I had to wait until my friends went to sleep so that I could play Legend of Zelda Link to the Past. I was a huge fan of the original, didn't like the second one, but wanted to play that game, and I know it's not JRPG, but that that hooked me on the Super Nintendo, and that those graphics, that charm, the the story that they were able to tell, so much more so than the regular Nintendo, was, was just awesome. And I think it was, I don't know, probably a year later, that we had saved up some money. The system had been out for a while and we knew somebody who was selling their Super Nintendo along with a couple of games. I don't remember what games were included. Probably no JRPGs. Uh, Unfortunately, one game that was included that I can remember was Shaq Fu. So whenever that game was out is when we got our system finally. And I started making up for lost time because there's a lot of games that I wanted. So... Each birthday and Christmas, I would get one or two, you know, new JRPGs. And you think $60 is expensive now. (laughs) Super Nintendo was notorious that um, games were way more than $60. It was not unusual to pay $90 for a game back in the day. Even $100 wasn't out of the, the realm of possibility. So... You really cherished what games, what games you got. Let's talk about the ones that we rented that I can remember more than anything. Uh, this game was a lot of fun. And I don't know who that is that owned it before, or at least owned the uh, slip. C. Nunez, thank you for that. But The Illusion of Gaia, that game was so much fun. We rented that quite a few times and played through it. Um, that's one of the games like I wish I could go back and play again. We talked about that on the games that need to be remade uh, episode with uh, Dalton a few weeks back. But we talked about it probably more than we <laughs> should have. But yeah, that was one of the ones that we rented and loved and played. Another one because... I had a brother, and we needed to play games that you could both play together. That was that was important. Um, that's how, back on the Nintendo, we played Double Dragon 2, and Jekyll, and Bubble Bobble, and all these uh, two-player games, uh, RC Pro, you know, those type ones. Um, but this was one of the first ones that I can remember. We were both old enough to play and really enjoyed and this is one of the reasons why I always say Squaresoft. Because <laughs> it's right there. Secret of Mana. Not a whole lot of, not a ton of story in there. There was at least a little bit. And I was able to, you know, read it to my brother and him understand. I was always the main character and he was always the little, little sprite magic user, right? And, uh, you know, computer could control the control the chick so that was from one of our local um a third shop that we rented from and what was really fun about that place was they they had this system where each box was on the shelf and then instead of bringing the box up to check it out they had little a little hook below each one and with like how many copies of it there were, there was a little keychain down below it on the hook. And so, I don't know how, but that shop had three copies of Secret of Mana. I remember this because we would always try to get the same copy. And each each keychain had that copy number, you know, written a number down on the bottom, matched it up with that 
with that game. And so we would go in there and we'd ask the, you know, dude behind the counter, like, can you look and see which, which number copy it is that we checked out last time? And if it's still there or not. And sometimes it was, but if it was, we always got that game. If it wasn't, we'd probably go and check out something else, but lots of good two player memories associated with secret of mana. Um, I wish there were more games like that. And I think that was, I was pretty disappointed that Charles Amana did not have a multiplayer and is not going to have a multiplayer. They're not going to add it uh, later, simply because of the fondness I have for playing that with two people back in the day. And it could be something that I could, you know, pass along and enjoy with my daughter now. But at least it's not going to happen with, with Charles of Mana, but... I don't know the order that I played these next four in or when I got them because, like I said, there's definitely times in between. And these are in no particular order, per se, but I think you know what we're going to talk about because these are four pretty heavy hitters. Um, I am... 99% 99% sure that these are my actual games that were purchased either for me or somehow saving up, you know, allowances or certain, you know, things that I purchased on my own. But Hans, that's my copy of Earthbound. I, <laughs> I wish somehow that I would have kept that giant box. I still have the um I still have the strategy guide for it. It's still sitting over there. Should I sure. Okay, hang on. I'm I'm gonna grab it. So this is gonna be some dead air for about two two or three seconds. Sorry, I could I should have got that beforehand. I almost did. But oh man. If you recall back on the Super Nintendo, you got this game or you got this guide in the giant box that came with the game along with those stinky smelly stickers, right? That uh that you could see how they were. But yeah, oh man. I have no idea how it's still in this condition. To be quite honest, it is. I loved Earthbound. I got so into that game. It was so different and refreshing from all the other, you know, JRPGs at the the time. And since then, like, I know there's been a few that have tried to get that formula, but they couldn't do it. And maybe because... I was a kid and you were playing with not teenagers, you know, that's not uncommon to get, uh, in our genre, but pretty much kids. Um, I mean, what are they like eight or nine at the time? I probably was around that same age when that game came out. I was like, Oh my goodness, this is so cool. And they're poking satire at the real world and real world things. The game was so good. So much fun. And I am... It's one of the things I'm most proud of is that I've still got these originals. And um, in the next episode, we'll talk about some things I regret with those things in mind. But... The next one. Talk about a game that was... Just the perfect example of what happens when two companies get together and make something better than either one of them could really do on their own. And if you notice here, I I assumed it was on there, but there's actually no mention of Square. Squaresoft on Super Mario RPG Legend of the Seven Stars. Nintendo got all that. And I'm sure it's on the the box itself, but on the actual cartridge, 
no mention of their involvement in that in that collaborative work but all these years later and you know we just got the new paper mario uh announced and obviously that was the spiritual successor to super mario rpg i never understood why and unless it's tied up in some sort of trademark battle why we never got a second game um it seems perfect for the switch for them to go back and make it i would even settle for a remake at this point because i think you could do that i think nintendo would be something that could redo that and redo it properly like from what Super Mario 64 was and how it was remade on the 3DS that type of game where you take the game and you just make it pretty right you don't change what worked about it you just make it using current technology you know um I got so into that game and I think that's why I'm so bummed that they never made anything else. Obviously they still you know, you've been fighting against Bowser for all these years and now he joins your party, right? Um how cool was that? Because they had to unite against a common foe. But let's move on to the next two and if you have listened to the JRPG report for any length of time, you're probably aware that these next two titles are my top two JRPGs of all time. And I have a funny story to go along with um, to go along with this one. As my copy of Final Fantasy III, if we loaded it up, you could uh, still see all my old save files on there. Um, Final Fantasy VI, as it was later known, I I definitely played four or two, you know, and then even Mystic Quest. Um, but I just never bought it. I guess I was able to play through it, rented it, and beat it. It's probably one of those ones I wish I did have, but I'm sure it would cost a lot of money to try to acquire it now. I definitely liked two, but by the time I got into this and the next game, I feel like it was later on, you know, in the Super Nintendo's life cycle. I was a little bit older, you know, getting towards the end of elementary school type years. And I needed something where something a little more mature, but not too much. To make you feel like you were playing something more epic. And both of these obviously fit the bill. I put so many hours into Final Fantasy 3. And I don't know if you remember this or not. But the Super Nintendo version. You could actually play it two player. And well. <laughs> not necessarily by choice. But we definitely had to both play. Both me and my brother had to play. Final Fantasy 3. I don't think he was as into it. Um, I think I've talked with him a few times afterwards. He enjoyed them. Like, I know he really liked Final Fantasy 10, but nothing close. To, he was much more of a casual JRPG player. And um, I know he would always want to play with, and I had no problem having uh, Sion, the, or Sion, however you say his name, the knight with the big sword. That was his character. He was named after him. Of course, you did that with all your characters. You you rename them. I was Locke. I was, you know, always had, we all had Celis and, um, Saban would usually make it in there as well, but, uh, he just wanted to control himself. Like I would usually control the other three and he would control, um, just him and, uh, led to a lot of fun, but it did have an interesting story, uh, later on in life. Um, when my mom had, remarried and we had a little another little brother had come along he was probably like six or so and we were both in there playing Final Fantasy 3 and playing two player and it was our turn to watch watch the baby or to help out you know and uh, 
we didn't want to stop playing and we didn't and he was a few months old and st- learned to sit up so we we stacked the pillows all around him so that if he fell over he fell onto a pillow we were we were watching <laughs> help watch our little brother right um we were certainly not qualified for the job but we we took it on uh nonetheless yeah but a lot of a lot of good memories with that one um i loved how it was definitely you know a more mature story at a coming of age time for me it it drew me into that world and i in terms of that it did more for me than uh numero uno but in terms of greatness I mean, it begins and ends there. Squaresoft knocked it out of the park. They told a story that had not ever really been tried to to be told before. And they did time travel, which nobody ever thought about. They took an overworld that you thought looked familiar and that you'd normally be fighting people in. And they said, no, you're just going to walk around in that. It's not till you get to the location and enter it that you're going to be doing the fighting. And when you're doing the fighting, you're going to experience this (laughs) turn-based, but still very much kind of active uh, battle system that in my opinion, has not been duplicated since. Um, So people have tried, but they haven't really accomplished it. It has been this long, and we still don't have a battle system that really, in my opinion, comes close to how great Chrono Trigger was, especially at the time, and with the technology involved. Certainly not the complete package of story, battle system, characters, world, (laughs) weapons. I mean, you get halfway through it, you fight the bad guy, um, he ends up later joining you, main character dies. I mean, there's so much that goes on there. You bring him back, just back and back and forth, all these different storylines. And then, as if that weren't enough, they give you this replayability against this ultimate bad guy and say, actually, you could go and fight this bad guy way early in the game. And if you could defeat him, you get this ending. Or you get this ending. I think it was, what, 10 endings that you could strive for and just give you all this more reason to want to play it. Very, very proud that I still have that game. That it has stayed with me all these years. And uh, will forever hold. I mean, look at the games that have come out here lately, right? We've got perfect examples of JRPGs with Dragon Quest XI... Persona 5 and Persona 5 Royal, and now like Final Fantasy 7 Remake. If those three games, which are pretty much the pinnacle of what a JRPG can be in this current gen of technology, I still think Chrono Trigger is better. You're not going to get better than that. Like, they have made the best game that they can make, and it's still not better than that. It would. If you remade Chrono Trigger, I don't think it would be as good as it was originally. And I think that just, that says it all in terms of, for me. Now, that is kind of my story growing up to, I don't know, age 13-ish. Right at the end of middle of elementary school, getting into middle school. And how those games kind of made me into this nerdy, (laughs) um, still very socially active. I mean, I still played sports all the time. I was, um, I played every sport, 
um, was excellent in school. Still read, I mean, but I had time for games and I, I made time for video games. And even to this day, it's one of those things like what you enjoy doing, you make time for because it's important to take a break. It's important to lose yourself doing things that you enjoy doing. Um, it's not cheap, but there are certainly more expensive <laughs> uh, time-consuming hobbies that you could easily pre- perform. So it started there, and I'm not even halfway through in terms of my life and how it affects, but I feel like I was able to elaborate a little bit more on that part. And so on next time, we'll get into the PlayStation years. And I will go through those a little bit more quickly as there's just not as much uh, time and story to tell. But I hope you have enjoyed this look back. Hopefully these were also some of the games that you enjoyed so much. Um, I, I really chose to talk about the ones that I still have with me. There's a few others that I don't that were important. Um, but these were the big ones. And like I said, I'm still very happy and proud that they're with me today and they're always going to be with me. They're, they're a part of who I am. And that's amazing that I was able to share that with you guys here today. So I hope you've enjoyed it. This is going to be it for the Sunday special number 17. Hope you've enjoyed listening and I hope you enjoyed watching. Uh, if you get a kick out of this video, make sure you give it a like, subscribe. I'll see you guys next time on Wednesday with a brand new episode of the JRPG Report with all the news and happenings of the week. But until then, my name is James Fisher. Get back out there and level up.